Welcome everyone. I'm Glenn Howard, president of the Jamestown Foundation, and we're happy that you're joining us for another episode of Eastern Approaches. This interview series is named after the famous book of the same name by former British diplomat, spy and adventurer, Sir Fitzroy MacLean. Each episode of Jamestown's Eastern Approaches features conversations with renowned experts on the most important geostrategic issues facing the United States and especially those of its allies in Eurasia. Today, we're delighted to have speaking with us Ajay Shukla, one of India's most respected experts on defense and strategic affairs. For this episode of Eastern Approaches, we thought it might be a good idea to revisit the situation in the Himalayas a year after the clashes in Galwan in eastern Ladakh province that killed 20 Indian and at least Chinese, four Chinese soldiers in one of the worst bouts of fighting in the Himalayas in the past 45 years. No one's better positioned to talk about this issue than retired Indian Colonel Ajay Shukla. So this is gonna be an exciting program for you today as we do a deep dive into the military situation on the Sino-Indian border one year after these clashes occurred. Ajay, thank you for coming on and I'd like to have you share your perspectives uh, in this session of Eastern Approaches to discuss uh, what has happened since uh, in the past year since the anniversary of, of what happened. Well, uh, a lot uh, of things that had to happen or that have happened uh, took place around the middle of last year. Uh, that was when the Chinese uh, sort of marched into La Eastern Ladakh. They crossed the line of actual control, uh, occupied uh, a, a bunch of positions uh, from north to south. Uh, there are about three large pockets where the Chinese continue to occupy positions. And what has really happened over the last few months is that these positions have solidified. Uh, there has been talk about mutual disengagement and mutual withdrawal, uh, but it has happened in only one sector near the near a lake, a very scenic lake in Ladakh called the Pangong Lake. Uh, that is one sector where both the Chinese and the Indian troops have pulled back a certain distance. Uh, there is a demilitarized zone uh, created between them, and peace seems to be reigning at least in that sector. Uh, but in at least three other sectors, the Chinese PLA troops continue to be in occupation of Indian territory. Uh, there have been periodic talks between senior commanders at, uh, on both sides, uh, but the Chinese seem fairly sort of uh, comfortable where they are, uh, and they are not inclined to any talk about withdrawing from these positions. So that's where we stand now. How have they solidified their positions in terms of the military infrastructure on the other side? Oh, well, uh, they came in firstly in very large numbers, uh, battalion strength, that's close on a thousand people, uh, a thousand soldiers on, in each sector. Uh, as you know, as all uh, your viewers would be knowing probably, uh, there, has, there have been regular patrol clashes uh, in disputed sectors of the line of actual control, but nothing like what has happened this time, where a large number of Chinese have come in, in several different spots along the frontier. So the Indian reaction has been divided, firstly, uh, and secondly, uh, the Chinese, uh, sort of to, to evict them, there will have to be some serious fighting. So they're trying to avoid that uh, already in one, one occasion, 20 lives were lost on the Indian side, uh, and an unknown number of Chinese soldiers were killed. They have not made the casualty account public, uh, but uh, that's, that's uh, sort of where we stand right now. Uh, in these other sectors, the Chinese continue to be over there, uh, and uh, th th there's no signs of uh, results being yielded by the talks between higher commanders. And how has this uh, affected India's strategic thinking since last year? What, uh, what have they been, how have they responded to it? How has it kind of affected their defense posture in the Himalayas? Yes, that's a, that's a central question uh, on what is happening now. Uh, essentially, uh, India, and to just give you your viewers a little bit of background, uh, the Indian Army has about 38 divisions uh, of troops. Uh, of those, the bulk had so far been deployed on the Pakistan frontier, on the line of control and the international border with Pakistan. Uh, there were essentially about 25 divisions deployed there and about 12 divisions deployed on the Chinese frontier. So with this incident, 
this long-standing, comfortable uh, sort of sort of deployment uh, has been completely re-evaluated. Uh, India has moved about five new divisions to the to the, the Chinese border. Uh, these have been pulled out from the Pakistan border. So there has been a significant de-escalation on the Pakistan border. Uh, and uh, sort of lots of new divisions pumped in on the Chinese border. So there has been what uh, Indian strategic thinkers call a pivot to the north, uh, the northern boundary with China, rather than uh, staying pivoted towards the western boundary with Pakistan. Uh, that's, a, that's a major change in security posture and military deployment, uh, and the Indian army is now getting used to this. And that um, pivot to the north, uh, you're kind of uh, hinting or suggesting uh, that India's strategic kind of fixation on Pakistan uh, has kind of affected a lot of India's uh, kind of perspective on uh, defense orientation and posture. And so what you're hinting at is the pivot to the north is now, it's pretty much official now solidified that they are now uh, dealing with it in a, in a dual front type of uh, strategic posture. Uh, that's absolutely right, Len. Uh, there's this uh, this uh, sort of uh, two front posture that has been talked about by the Indian uh, military, but it's essentially been a posture where the Pakistan front has had many more troops than the Chinese front, uh, and that has now been remedied by the thing, by the redeployment that has taken place and the shift in emphasis to the to the northern boundary has taken place. So uh, yeah, uh, this is there's sort of uh, not uh, much to hint at over here. This is public knowledge on the Indian side. The Indian government has acknowledged it, uh, and uh, you know this, the 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 comfortable relationship that has existed so far on the Sino-Indian border, uh, where you know there's been occasional patrol confrontations, but no killing, no uh, violent sort of clashes. Uh, that is very different from the Pakistan border. The line of control with Pakistan is an extremely violent and an extremely act act active frontier. So uh, that has seems to have cooled down now. Uh, there was there was a lot of apprehension on the Indian side that the Pakistanis might try to take advantage of the situation created by the Chinese, but that has not happened. In fact, uh, quite to the contrary, there has been a ceasefire that has come into place between India and Pakistan. Uh, but the Chinese border now appears to be the major preoccupation with the Pakistani border taking second place. And how do you perceive kind of Indian military has always felt that it had a uh, strategic air advantage um, against China and the Himalayas. That's always been an area that they felt very more confident. But you've seen on the other side of the border in Tibet, uh, China's increasingly uh, uh, with its buildup in Tibet. Uh, increased its air infra infrastructure, transportation capabilities for its air force. So how do you perceive things on, on the Tibet side of the border in military infrastructure and China's changing posture there? Oh, well, there's, there's a little doubt that China has built up very strongly uh, over there on, the, on its own side of the border. Uh, we had talked earlier about battalion uh, strength infiltration carried out by the Chinese. But each one of those battalions has at least a brigade in depth. Uh, and that brigade is now supported by, uh, by air power, with China activating several airfields in Tibet. Uh, so the Indian sort of uh, comfort levels uh, over air power seem to be getting eroded now. Uh, India has always believed that because its aircraft take off and operate and land back in uh, in airfields that are at lower altitudes on the plains, uh, the, those air, aircraft can uh, operate much more easily. They can get airborne with greater payloads of weapons and, and uh, uh, fuel, uh, and therefore they have an advantage against Ch the Chinese aircraft. Uh, that is true to an extent because the Chinese aircraft uh, are operating from the Tibet plateau, 12,000, 13,000 feet high airfields, uh, there is a severe limitation on the payload they can carry. Uh, but now the Chinese are trying to make up in numbers what they lack in individual capability of the aircraft. So to that extent, uh, the Indian side is, uh, is watching the situation very carefully. The air buildup, the artillery buildup, 
uh, how much will this actually result in in terms of the force generation on the ground uh, that remains to be seen with that you raise a really interesting point about this uh, battalion uh the battalion level being uh, a brigade in depth uh in tibet and i and there's been some discussion in the indian media um some strategic discussion of a chinese term called first mover advantage in the himalayas and I wanted to ask you about that term has been used a lot by Indian analysts. And I'd like to ask you just kind of what what do they mean when they talk about first mover advantage in the Himalayas? Is in is I, I assume it's a form of mobility for the Chinese military. Oh well, the Chinese military's uh, mobility superiority is well known. Uh, over the years, they've built a lot of. Uh, infrastructure, especially, especially road infrastructure that links up to the forward, uh, forward deployed uh, soldiers. The Chinese uh, are not like the Indians who, who sort of uh, who fits through really bad uh, terrain and countryside to reach their troops. Uh, but the Chinese have made it much easier, much faster, much quicker to reach their troops and to supply their troops with the logistics they need to operate in these areas. Now, when they talk about first mover advantage, it is that uh, when you actually uh, decide on a, on a particular uh, sector or subsector to go active there, uh, the PLA is able to do that much quicker than the Indian side. Uh, its first mover advantage comes from the fact that when it decides to operate in a particular sector or to be offensive in that sector, uh, it can quickly build up uh, and have that advantage while the Indians then react to what uh, has taken place. And the reaction takes place in really bad terrain. Uh, it takes a lot of time uh, and the operational advantage therefore is entirely the, the first movers. Uh, which the Chinese ensure that they are in that happy position. Uh, the Indian side uh, uh, sort of thinks it can get past this by building up infrastructure, and now there's a serious infrastructure building drive underway. Well, does that, um, I mean, that, that's a kind of a strategic paradox for India, isn't it? I mean, it's always had this disadvantage of being able to react very slowly uh, to this advantage that China has in, in terms of its mobility. Um, but China can take a piece of territory and then kind of occupy it, pause, and then force India to react, but then it keeps kind of this incrementally encroachment upon India uh, that creates this kind of this major strategic uh debate inside of India. Do we, you know, how do how do we react to this? Do we move in? Do we you know, do we aggressively push back on this? I mean, uh, th that, that seems that the first mover advantage is really something China historically has kind of used in the Himalayas. Am I well, not? they have, uh, to begin with, they have geography on their side. The Tibetan plateau is a much easier place to move uh, large bodies of troops uh, when you compare that with the Indian side, because the Indian side has a uh, terrain that is very rough very disadvantages for rapid movement. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's not as if the Indian side is reconciled to this disadvantage and says that nothing can be done about it. Uh, over the years, over the, I, I would say over the last uh, two or three years, uh, there has been a massive infrastructure building uh, drive by India uh, because they, they, they sort of want to ensure that uh, they are able to react quickly to any Chinese actions. Uh, this uh, change in status quo, as we call it, uh, on, the, on the question of infrastructure is something that China has uh, cited during this particular crisis as one of the major drivers of what it has done. Uh, statements from Beijing have specifically cited uh, the, uh, the creation of a road in Ladakh by the Indian side as one of the reasons why it uh, sort of, it has acted the way it, done, it uh, did. So the Indians are trying to continue building uh, sort of uh, road infrastructure, uh, but they are, were very far behind the Chinese in this. Uh, and now with the Chinese having signaled that they will not tolerate the creation of infrastructure, uh, India's task becomes even more complex because it has to cater for a Chinese reaction now 
to any infrastructure that it chooses to build. So difficult choices there, but, but uh, it has to be said that the Indians have not uh, sort of been deterred by these Chinese statements. Uh, there, are, there have been about 44 new roads inaugurated uh, by the defense minister just recently, last week, as a matter of fact. Uh, and uh, one can expect, watchers can expect the Indian infrastructure building to continue uh, to try in some way to, to get over this disadvantage. What changes have you seen in terms of uh, the PLA's training tempo uh, in the Himalayas? Is there a picked up tempo? I mean, what in general, how, how, what do you see across the board on the other side of the border in terms of the tempo of their training? Oh, well, uh, the Chinese are trying to make a statement over here. So uh, they, they are very sort of openly and very pr prominently carrying out training activities, not just ground soldiers activities, their air force has been training in the area. Uh, and uh, sort of uh, the Indian side has not been uh, idle either. It's been uh, sort of rotating its troops from the forward positions. Uh, you don't uh, stay at a uh, 15,000 foot height very long. Uh, acclimatization requirements uh, sort of militate uh, against that. Uh, and the Indian side has been training as well. So this is, uh, this is uh, sort of something that armies do. You know, when you're deployed, uh, you have a certain forward posture uh, deployment and then you rotate troops through those deployments. Uh, and that's what the Indian side is doing. Uh, I would not say that the Chinese uh, sort of training activities are uh, cause for greater alarm or concern. Uh, the, the numbers of Chinese in the buildup is certainly cause for concern, but they are doing over there in those forward locations what militaries do, uh, and the Indian side is doing that as well. So you've seen no change in the PLA's training tempo? Oh, yes, there has been change in the training tempo because the PLA soldiers that were there and the numbers that were there during uh, previous years uh, have been completely surpassed by what is there now. So in a way, there is a sort of a change in the tempo, but that change in tempo comes not just from uh, sort of the numbers, uh, uh, not just from the fact that they're uh, displaying an aggressive intent, but just by the fact that they are there. Uh, so I would say that uh, that is uh, what the Indian side is monitoring very carefully uh, while doing its own training as well. But in the past year, has that noticeably changed, remained the same? Uh, it has absolutely uh, changed. Uh, but that is, as I said, because of the numbers of troops that are over there. Uh, you know, when you have a brigade, you have a battalion that is forward deployed. Uh, on the frontier, on the line of actual control, the two battalions that are there at the rear would be carrying out some manner of training activity. And when this battalion that is forward deployed is relieved and comes to the rear, it would get onto training activities of its own. Uh, so that is the sort of difference that can be seen at this time. And it stems not from intent or uh, evidence of a plan to attack, but because there's a large number of troops there and they need to train and be occupied. Well, I have another question for you, um, and thank you for clarifying that. Um, but one would not think of the Himalayas being a place for naval warfare, uh, but I have seen some references in the media about Pengong Lake and uh, moving some some type of some type of because of the bridge that was built across there, the the aspects of moving some boats into Pengong Lake by the Indian military to improve their mobility. Can, can you briefly kind of um, talk about that at all? Are you familiar with uh, that type of, those, are those rumored developments? Yeah, that's, uh, that's absolutely right. And, you know, it's everything about this uh, uh, occupation of defenses on these extremely high mountains uh, is sort of uh, incongruous in a way. And this is one more incongruous thing in the uh, Sino-Indian line of actual control, which is that you have these large bodies of freshwater lakes, which also uh, have a frontier going through them. So when you're patrolling uh, land frontiers, you also have to patrol uh, the, the, the lake frontiers, the water frontiers as well. So that is done through these uh, speedboats, 
uh, both sides come and try and patrol on, in speed boats up to the sort of the occupation line, the line that they claim. Uh, and you have this uh, sort of uh, uh, spectacle going on of boats bumping into each other and trying to muscle each other off from the areas that they're trying to patrol. But these are not naval boats. These are boats uh, that are operated by engineer regiments. And uh, they, they carry the boats, soldiers with them. Are the boats armed? Uh, no, they, they, they are not armed because uh, one of the sort of agreements that India and China have sort of adhered wow. to is that they will not do armed patrolling. So the boats are sort of, they're like large uh, sort of uh, battering rams that go and occasionally bump again to the other side. Uh, it's just psychological dominance that everybody is trying to create in those areas. And that's what the explanation to this is. So, th so they may be, uh, instead of using clubs, they may be whacking each other with oars. Is that, is that what they may be doing? <laughs> that's absolutely right, yeah. Well, you know, that's a fascinating topic about Pengong Lake. Does, does uh, Pengong Lake also have Chinese boats on the lake as well as Indian? Oh, yes, absolutely. Both sides patrol in boats. Huh. So they, so they kind of go back and forth up to the, to the demarcation line in the lake. Is that how it works? Just like they do patrol on foot, they patrol up to the demarcation line, the line of actual control, as it's called, and come back. They do exactly the same thing on the water frontier with speedboats. But on the opposite side, on the Chinese side of the lake, there are patrols by both sides, but they have this kind of finger projection there into Pengong Lake that is uh, where they were moving in. They were uh, uh, eliminating uh, the soil, the cliffs, so that they could have a wider road to travel. I mean, and that's, that's a part of their kind of engineering um, improvements to the infrastructure on the other side. Is that correct? Oh, well, uh, the fingers themselves are merely spurs that run down from the, from the major feature uh, to the lake and uh, they are used for demarcating uh, sort of patrolling activities and now in the, the, the line of actual control itself. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, when the Chinese came in or when the Indians also moved up and started deploying and occupying defenses on those hills, uh, they have to create bunkers, they have to create pillboxes, they have to create uh, mortar positions, gun positions and so on, headquarters uh, bunkers. Uh, so that is the train, this digging activity and the, the sort of engineering construction activity that we've been seeing during this crisis. The Chinese are better at it. They, they have uh, better access for one. They're also just better at doing infrastructure. The whole world has learned that to its cost. Uh, and uh, that is what they are doing. But this time, the Indians, once they decided to occupy positions on the Kailash Range and other places in, near the Pangong Lake, uh, they did their own build, bit of building activity as well. In the Chinese side, do you see signs of them uh, uh, stockpiling oil and petroleum for, because in order to build, um, to improve the infrastructure, you need to operate off of fuel. I mean, so are they, uh, do they create uh, oil depots there in that area as well? Or, I mean, is that, or does everything kind of have to be brought in uh, in a way that that's, I, 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 I must confess, I'm not sure whether the Chinese have created an oil depot or, or uh, pipelines or, or, or something like that. But I would imagine that, uh, and this is certainly true for the Indian side, that when you're in occupation of a, a sort of a, a position where you anticipate fighting, you generally move up only as much fuel, oil, and lubricants, FOL it's called, yeah. uh, as you would actually require, not just for, uh, for sort of, for easing logistic activities, but also because this is all very inflammable material. So uh, I don't know whether the Chinese have built any, row, any pipelines or any major depots, but certainly to the rear, they would have stockpiled ammunition, fuel, oil, and lubricants, uh, rations, even water over there, because the water is very hard to come by in those uh, altitudes. So they just don't dip into the lake and uh, and, uh, and 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 resupply their refill their canteens. I, I guess so. Yeah.
Well, <laughs> when it comes to shop. I'm, I'm, I'm very fascinated by Pengong Lake. I think there's a whole lot of military dimensions to that lake that people kind of, you know, uh, most Western experts kind of focus on the bigger picture, but these minor details I think are fascinating. Uh, and, and, I, and, I, and I appreciate your kind of insight on that. I, it's interesting that, they're, that the boats are run by Indian engineering uh, units. That, 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 kind of, uh, that kind of, I guess in a way, demilitarizes operations on the lake. Is that correct? Uh, not, not really, uh, because, uh, you know, it's very unusual for an infantry battalion to be in a position where they have to operate speedboats. Speedboats yeah. are mainly operated by engineers because they are required in bridging activities and canal crossing activities and river crossing activities. So traditionally, boats go hand in glove with uh, engineering work. Uh, it, the, it, the, the battalion that is currently, let's say, in Pangong Lake and patrolling there would probably never before have experienced the need for boat patrolling activity. This is something that's highly unusual and special to this particular sector. So uh, that's one of the reasons why engineers tend to operate boats because engineers use boats in multiple sectors that they work in. Yeah, and, and is the number of boats, I, I would assume, I think I've seen reports of five or six boats. Is that a, a safe, uh, rough estimate? Oh, well, there, there would certainly be more than that, but uh, the, 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 the ones in operation at any given time would be a smaller number. Right. You'd have some as standby, you know, just in case a boat gets sunk or uh, that see if it stops functioning or something. But uh, the front, the, the sort of frontline patrolling activity would be by just a handful, the numbers that you mentioned. Well, going back to the talks on the positions and the fingers around the lake, um, I wanted to ask you is, um, do you think India made a mistake in giving up the heights on the south southern part of the lake? Um, the, there was a much debate in India whether they should have done that or not. There's been 11 rounds of talks between the core commanders of both armies with only one breakthrough, and uh, which resulted in both sides pulling back troops from Pangong, uh, Pangong So. Um, so the seizure of the heights of the Kalish range by the Indian Special Forces in earlier in the year, that gave India some leverage. Uh, so kind of where do we, where do we stand on, on those aspect of those strategic heights? Have you, is that something you could share with us? Uh, yes, this is something that uh, I have certainly written on. Uh, and I taken the position that we uh, gave up control of those heights uh, too easily and without extracting enough of a sort of return uh, concession. Uh, in return for vacating the heights on the Kailash range, and these are heights at 15,000, 16,000 feet, which are sort of well nigh impossible to capture uh, in the face of a determined defender. Uh, these are heights that dominate and overlook the Pangong Lake and the positions the, around the lake that the Chinese would use in making an, any advance uh, into India. Uh, in return for conceding these very strategic heights, or I should say tactically important heights, uh, we just got a demilitarization from the finger area of the north bank of the Pangong So. Uh, I would say it was not enough of a concession. India should have stuck to its guns, retained those, uh, those heights, uh, and if we had to vacate them, we should have extracted a higher price. Is so then the the, the importance of the Kalish range and those heights is uh, from a military tactical standpoint. Is they you don't want them to turn your flanks. Is that basically the idea behind that particular height and why it's important? Well, the the the, the truth is that in a place like Ladakh. Uh, no matter where you deploy, there's a way of turning your flank because it's generally uh, flat countryside. Uh, it has uh, sort of multiple approaches coming in through valleys and so on. So uh, you sort of turning a flank is not so much uh, a concern as the, the, the ability that these heights gave us to observe what the Chinese were doing, both in the Pangongso sector as well as another very sort of uh, 
uh, important uh, sort of entrance route into the Indian side, which is called the Spangur Gap. Uh, you know, uh, India sort of had deployed, deployed tanks, heavy vehicles, and so on to to guard these gaps and positions. But uh, there's nothing like a good observation post. That's something that gives you a very good, good, great tactical sort of weapon that you can use. And that is what was given up when India withdrew from the Kailash range. Well, thank you for that explanation. I, I, I think it doesn't get enough attention uh, in the discussions. And I, I wanted to move on back to kind of some of the uh, organizational changes in the Indian Army, if I could ask you to comment about um, that re India recently has reorganized about 19 individual military commands into five unified military theater commands. Um, while this would potentially be the country's largest, most consequential military reform uh, in its history, the issue of these theater commands has been a matter of kind of official discussion in India since the 1999 Cargill War. Uh, what is different now in terms of those commands? Uh, well, uh, you know, India has always looked at uh, the United States structure where you have geographical commands as well as uh, functional commands uh, and uh, sort of uh, and debated uh, internally about whether this would be a better structure for India than you know individual service commands that we have right now. Those 19 commands that you talk about include the different commands of the Indian Army, the Indian Navy and the Indian Air Force. Uh, each of them have different commands with different territorial jurisdictions and so on. Uh, and uh, it has always been debated about whether it would be better to switch to a, to a sort of a joint command structure where a command would have elements of the Air Force, uh, elements of the Army, as well as the Navy for, air, for sectors, of course, where uh, you have uh, water to, for the Navy to operate in. Uh, this is what India is currently trying to implement. They were further galvanized by the Chinese shift to joint theater commands. Uh, and they're trying to do that on the Indian side as well. Uh, it has uh, sort of so far been ma mainly done at the apex level with the appointment of a tri-service chief of defense staff, uh, a full general who, who sort of is the overall commander of the three services. Uh, so uh, this is something which is uh, a job in progress. Uh, there are some areas where it works in India. The United States, of course, has a much larger territorial vision for its, uh, its uh, soldiers. So it makes definite sense for them, but it makes sense for India in some areas, in some areas it doesn't. So, so when you say that India kind of looked at what the U.S. did with this theater commands, you're, you're referring to uh, CENTCOM and the way that the territorially that the, the U.S. had divided up into theaters. Is that what you you mean? Yes, that's that's exactly what I'm referring to. The the sort of geographical combat commands that the United States has uh, to look after specified territorial jurisdictions. Okay, that's uh, and and it's interesting. You said that you the Indians have also seen the Chinese shift to theater commands as well, and that they that also kind of has influenced their thinking. That that was an interesting comment you made. That that was uh, you know China is our is our big neighbor and our big threat. So what China does is observe very closely and carefully on the Indian side, uh, and uh, the Chinese have sort of uh, done it in. Uh, in short order and with uh, with great intent. Uh, so India looks at it both in terms of the threat that it poses and an opportunity to emulate. Yes, that's a, that's really uh, that's very interesting. I I, uh, I I I hope that I mean, with nineteen different uh, individual military commands. I mean, uh, the Westerners and yeah, it make, and, makes no sense at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's it's certainly that it, you need to streamline your decision making and your your ability to react, and that that more than anything kind of complicates it. And 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 when there's all these different military commands, everybody has their own uh, their own uh, territory uh, that they want to they want to protect that that right within the Indian military because they get a certain amount of resources from the Indian government. It's, it's all it's all about turf battles. Listen, I wanted to ask you, um, turning to the larger regional perspective, 
Um, certainly the uh, Bhutan and Nepal are very strategically important to India. What have you seen uh, in terms of developments in Nepal and Bhutan uh, in the past year? Uh, obviously, India used to have a very dominant position in Nepal, uh, and it's seen that situation erode inside of Nepal as the Chinese have gained greater influence uh, inside of Nepal. Um, could you just briefly kind of comment about the two, the two, um, the two countries and how that's... Sure, sure. Uh, Nepal and Bhutan are two uh, very different cases. They're, they're similar only that they happen to be neighbors of India and they're buffers between India and China. But the, the issue that is sort of the, or the political strategic issue that is playing out between them is different. Uh, with Nepal, uh, there has been uh, sort of uh, over the years, uh, a certain degree of resentment built up within the Nep Nepali uh, political strategic class uh, about uh, perceived domination by India uh, and a perceived uh, sort of pressure that they say India exerts uh, on them to take decisions in a certain manner that favors India and doesn't favor China. Uh, so this is uh, this is sort of blown up over the years with Nepal, uh, come out in the open, and you actually had a situation during this crisis that we are discussing, where Nepal made a claim on uh, a certain border area on the tri-junction between Nepal, India, and China. So India found itself suddenly not just tackling the Chinese, but the Nepal Nepalese also uh, taking the Chinese side. Uh, with Bhutan, it's been uh, a different story. Bhutan has been, for all practical purposes, a protectorate of India. Uh, and uh, a, a treaty between India and Bhutan, in fact, enjoins the Bhutanese to act in a manner that safeguards India's interests. Now, all of this blew up in 2017 when uh, Chinese troops marched into a little area on the tri-junction called Doklam. Uh, and uh, this is territory disputed between China and Bhutan, but Indian troops went in to stop the Chinese. Uh, they sort of uh, physically blocked the Chinese from entering Bhutanese territory. Uh, and uh, the Chinese were sort of taken aback and uh, sort of angered by the fact that India had confronted them in the territory of a third country. So that's, uh, that's uh, sort of still playing out those resentments. China is putting pressure on Bhutan to uh, cede that territory that uh, was the subject of the 2017 occupation. <coughs> Bhutan is not doing so, at least not so far. Uh, and uh, what we can be sure of is that we will continue to see Chinese efforts to create a presence in Bhutan and to put pressure on Bhutan to act their way. Do you think um, recently with the development of the Quad, uh, in the Indo-Pacific, uh, India has been added to that. And is there areas within the Quad discussions where the Himalayas could be brought up and, and, and as an element of that discussion? Um, I know the Australians pay a lot of attention to, to your border problems and concerns. I think this is an issue. I think Japan also has a concern about uh, but does it, when you create the quad, does that also allow you, do did, did you think Indian officials have used that enough um, to push, you know, its concerns about the Himalayas, or, or does it not want to bring that up within the quad? Uh, the thinking amongst uh, Indian strategic circles is that uh, at the end of the day, India is the only one of the quad countries that has a land border and a highly contested land border with China. Uh, the rest are all sort of maritime frontiers. Uh, and the belief in, on the, in the Indian side is uh, that when push comes to shove on the land frontier, uh, regardless of which uh, sort of uh, partnerships and, and groupings you're a part of, uh, India will have to face that problem alone and deal with the Chinese alone. Uh, and this kind of thinking is reinforced by the current uh, sort of crisis which is playing out uh, in which India is alone in dealing with, uh, with China. Uh, the others stand by to help in terms of uh, sort of uh, maritime frontiers, the Indo-Pacific, the Western Pacific, and so on. 
but uh, India will have to deal with China alone on the land frontier. So that's one reason why the Indian sort of side uh, and the diplomatic thinking in on the Indian side is that we need to sort of safeguard our interests uh, on the land frontier ourselves. And if we get too far uh, into partnership or alliance with the other Quad countries, uh, that would have an effect uh, on, on Chinese behavior on our land frontier as well. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a sort of a balancing act that the Indians end up doing. Uh, and uh, they, they, they sort of rightly justify it by pointing to uh, Australia, for example, which has changed position several times uh, on China. Uh, currently, of course, it's very uh, gung-ho on China, but the, the sort of Prime Minister Hawk era is, uh, is not forgotten. Uh, and uh, the Indian side tends to be uh, sort of uh, to see uh, the, the Quad as a useful grouping, a grouping that provides clear benefits uh, in the waters of the Indo-Pacific and perhaps in the Indian Ocean someday, uh, but not on the land frontier. And over there, India will stand alone. Do you think the United States, or say its allies also, uh, we've been making the argument that more of the Quad countries should be involved with Nepal uh, in terms of economic assistance and trying to counter Chinese influence in Nepal. I mean, uh, I, I would think that'd be something that you would agree with, and, and certainly the Japanese could be more um, uh, forthcoming in providing economic assistance to Nepal. Does, I, I kind of feel like the West has kind of given the, the playing field to uh, to China and Nepal and not paid enough attention to it. And certainly it's an important area uh, for collecting information about developments in Tibet. I mean, we've heard um, in the past year, a lot of attention fo focused on the Uyghurs uh, and, the, and the human rights conditions there, but we kind of have lost sight of Tibet. It, it, and, and, it's, uh, and Nepal's an important neighbor of Tibet. So the, the two are kind of interconnected in many ways. Uh, yes, but uh, that, that having been said, a lot of these countries that are in the South Asian sort of borderlands, the Himalayan borderlands, whether Nepal, whether Bhutan, and Sikkim before that, uh, before Sikkim was annexed by India, uh, they tend to take a, a sort of a, a balanced position uh, where they are able to sit on the fence and they're quite sort of almost literally sitting on the fence uh, between India and China uh, and extract whatever concessions they can from them. Uh, China is, as you know, it's uh, with its wolf warrior diplomacy uh, sort of in full swing, it's able to throw around a lot more money than, uh, than uh, India can. Uh, Japan perhaps would be able to match China's, uh, but, but uh, you know, uh, to visualize Japan uh, giving large sums of aid to a country as far away and remote as, as Nepal uh, is, is uh, sort of doesn't seem like a very credible argument to, mo to most Indian minds. Uh, India itself, uh, I mean, it's a poor country, but it has a, a sort of a significant outflow of aid itself to both Nepal and Bhutan. Uh, to Bhutan, their aid from India is in the region of a billion dollars every year, which for a, such a small country is a, is a large sum of money. So uh, this, uh, this uh, sort of uh, wooing by aid uh, sort of uh, hypothesis uh, is something that China sort of is, is very well placed to counter. Uh, and it is doing what it can to enhance its influence in both Nepal and Bhutan. Uh, even though India is trying to counter that. Well, moving further in your neighborhood, um, can you kind of share some of your your thoughts and concerns about the the uh, the developments in Myanmar and kind of do you have any concerns about the direction that the military uh, has gone or will take? I, I know India has been uh, opposed to the idea of isolating Burma. And uh, that's been currently the idea of sanctions, et cetera, a lot of things being put on them. Um, do you, but India has been more uh, pragmatic in its approach to Burma. I mean, uh, can you just kind of describe what you see with Myanmar happening and, and, and kind of the Indian reaction? Uh, 
Myanmar, Myanmar is uh, sort of it's increasingly a country of concern for India, uh, not just because of the uh, access routes it provides and the corridors it provides China, uh, going up to Kunming and uh, the southern Chinese provinces, <clears throat> but also because uh, there are there's a lot of potential for trouble to wash across the border from uh, from uh, Myanmar and Bangladesh. Uh, not least because of the the sort of uh, confrontation or the the, the Rohingya uh, crisis that is playing out over there, uh, there are Rohingyas who were given uh, who were given uh, shelter in India, a large number of them, in fact, and that then led to a political sort of uh, confrontation within the Indian polity uh, about why we are giving uh, sort of shelter to. Uh, uh, potentially militant uh, Muslim people. Uh, with the Indian government, the BJP's politics of uh, religious polarization, well known to everyone, uh, the BJP sort of made an issue out of this. So we had to give back the Rohingyas to Myanmar. Now the Myanmaris are not keen on taking them back either. So this was leading to a bit of a, bit of a sort of confrontation between India and Myanmar. India has its own uh, little corridor, which it's economic corridor, which it's trying to run through Myanmar to connect its far eastern states. Uh, the Kaladan multimodal project, it's called. Yes. Uh, that, that is not making very good headway. It's, it's, a, it's a bit of a mess right now. It isn't a clear cut policy that India is following, uh, but a lot of it has to do with this uh, jostling for influence between China and India. Well, is, it, is that roadway network that you talked about uh, that India has been promoting? I mean, is that something where the United States and the West could help India uh, by countering China with its own kind of Belt and Road Initiative to try to help improve the logistical, the East-West trade corridor that you're trying to, you're trying to counter the North-South trade corridor between China and, and Burma? Um, is that something where the United States could help? Well, the United States uh, sort of can help, but it generally ends up hindering uh, yeah. because the United States has made, uh, no, I don't mean that in a, in a sort of overly critical way, but purely factual, uh, the, the sort of uh, anti-democracy sort of uh, issues that, uh, that are uh, a problem in Myanmar uh, and the, the sort of uh, the counter to that by the pro-democracy forces, Aung San Suu Kyi and so on, uh, the Americans uh, sort of, uh, the critical sort of uh, statements that come out of America uh, and the fact that America tends to take a very moralistic position on, on uh, dem dem democracy uh, and the, the sort of uh, the Myanmar's army, the Tamadao as it, it's called, uh, does not take kindly to this at all. Uh, and that leaves very little room for India to take a position, uh, sort of a moral position on, on that as well. So India generally tends ends up uh, trying to do a mixture of not make statements at all. And uh, when it does make statements, make statements supportive of the military uh, and the, the sort of uh, uh, the government of Myanmar such as it exists. Uh, so that causes a bit of friction, a bit of uh, sort of diplomatic footwork, fancy footwork is required. Uh, and that is what uh, India's problem with Myanmar is. But does the Tamadol, uh, the Tamadol also has kind of reservations about China. I mean, they, they will kind of play this pivoting game where they'll kind of engage China and then at the same time they have these reservations about China. Um, and they do harbor a, a level of mistrust of China, especially uh, China's support of some of these insurgencies in Myanmar uh, that they've in the past they've been rumored to be behind some of these uh, small scale insurgencies. Is that uh, do you agree with that? Yeah, that's that's absolutely correct. You you've hit the nail on the head. Uh, the, the the sort of actions and the position taken by the Tamadao is something that India tends to appreciate and uh, sort of. Uh, thank its lucky stars for, because on the one hand you have stay you have uh, neighboring countries 
that are sort of very deep in the Chinese lap, uh, Pakistan, for example. Uh, and therefore, when you have a country that's taking a balanced position as Myanmar is, uh, and uh, sort of uh, trying to uh, mitigate Chinese influence, if not actually uh, sort of confront it, uh, that's, that's a good option when seen from New Delhi. Uh, it, this, this looks to most uh, people in India, to strategic thinkers, uh, as if Myanmar is balancing and therefore not falling into China's lap. That's something that is well appreciated on the Indian side. Uh, and when it sort of is called upon to make statements or to take a position on Myanmar's democracy movement or, uh, or sort of uh, military junta, uh, it's it's sort of it makes India uncomfortable. It puts it into a position where it has to court uh, the displeasure of the Myanmaris military, and that uh, is something that uh, is best avoided in this context. Well, how, but how does China use these low-level insurgencies in the case of Myanmar? I mean, they kind of turn up the heat a little bit, then they reduce it. I mean, uh, there's been these rumored involvement of the Chinese and backing these, but they keep it this low level where it's hard to kind of see exactly what they're doing, but isn't across the board, uh, China uses these types of Maoist insurgencies um, in along India's periphery as a way to kind of uh, keep its presence? Uh, yes, the, the Chinese have traditionally uh, sort of played this game of supporting militias uh, one after the other, the Shan first and the Kachins. <clears throat> it's it's uh, it's no different uh, as India sees it from how China was dealing with India's northeastern states when the Naga insurgency was in full cry. The Manipuri groups were acting up. The Mizo insurgents were acting up. In those days, there was a well-established route for these insurgents to cross through Myanmar, uh, go through the Kachin areas, go and get training in uh, Kunming province in, in China. So uh, China has been playing this game in this uh, very volatile region for a long time. Uh, it is; It hasn't been doing it uh, over the last couple of decades in India, but Myanmar, yes, absolutely, they, they, they play one militant group against the other, and they possess enormous leverage, the Chinese, because of the supply of arms that they're able to give. Uh, if, you're, if you're giving, uh, let's say, the Kachin Independent Army uh, a good supply of weaponry, uh, you have, you've pretty much got them in your pocket. Uh, so China is playing this game. Uh, it's, it's sort of uh, not appreciated by the Myanmar junta, but uh, still goes on. Does does the junta keep? I mean, they're but the, the Kachin are under kind of uh, they're under uh, the word is under wraps. I mean, they're kind of uh, are they kind of are they still a problem for the the military junta in Myanmar? Oh yes, absolutely. All all these groups continue to be a problem for the military. Uh, they, they sort of come together. It's a very amorphous and very shifting uh, sort of set of dynamics over there. Groups come together, they split apart, uh, they have fights amongst themselves. Uh, you've suddenly, you've got this group in the, in the southern mountain areas of Myanmar now, which is emerging as a serious threat to the, to the main junta. Uh, so there, there's, there is no question, these groups uh, are a nuisance. They erode the authority and the sort of control of the Tamadao, uh, and the Tamadao is not pleased with China for, for facilitating this. Would you say the Tamadao is now still balancing with China, or do you think they've kind of pivoted closer to China since the coup? Uh, I would say that they, they maintain a hands-off distance. They uh, sort of uh, are dependent on uh, China for uh, for several aspects of economic activity, for weaponry and so on. And uh, the, the sort of screw that the Chinese turn with great calibration is their supply of weaponry to the insurgent groups. So when they are displeased with uh, the Tamadao, right. then you, you start having, uh, you know, uh, and, and the Tamadao in recent times has sort of uh, published a couple of articles in the national press 
sharply criticizing the Chinese. Uh, and that was it after one of these incidents when a weapon supply was captured or intercepted by the Tamadao. So there, there, there's Recently. a sort of unhappy sort of medium that they are at. But the Chinese uh, sort of, they, they, they know how to make their money talk. Uh, and to that extent, they have a, a lot of leverage in Myanmar. Well, listen, I want to I, I, I want to further tap into your strategic inside uh, as one of India's leading strategic analysts uh, and talk about the That's American very kind of you, though. It's not true. OK, well, uh, we certainly value your insights. And I do want to uh, ask a question about what are your impressions about the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan? And how do you see Afghanistan changing, evolving? How does Pakistan's role going to change after the departure? Well, uh, in uh, sort of in the Indians' perspe perspective, according to uh, the, the 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 uh, sort of uh, the increase in the leverage of the Taliban. Uh, which, as uh, it's no secret, India sees them as uh, Pakistani proxies in Afghanistan. Uh, the, the, the sort of the increase in uh, leverage of the Taliban and their move up through central Afghanistan into the north where they are now emerging uh, is uh, an unmitigated disaster. Uh, let me be sort of quite frank uh, on that respect. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a sort of uh, an Indian position that in Afghanistan, uh, there should not be untrammeled power wielded by any uh, sort of Sunni Muslim insurgent group. Uh, and that is code for the Taliban. Sunni Muslim insurgent groups, uh, by that the Indians mean the Taliban. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you're, when you're seeing, you're observing, uh, that you've been cut out of the process, and I'm talking about the Indian government now, they are completely, they don't have any leverage in the process. They have not uh, sort of built links with the Taliban themselves, which is a major strategic blunder uh, over the preceding two decades. Uh, they are, they, they have, there is very little leverage with the Taliban. Uh, their traditional groups uh, uh, that the Indians have supported, which is the Pancheri groups, the Northern Alliance, uh, the Hazara groups, uh, these are now sort of uh, on the back foot against the Taliban. So to that extent, it's, uh, it's back to what we were like in the 1990s uh, when the, the Russians had left uh, Afghanistan. It's not a happy situation. I agree. Um, but the Indian government did reach out and meet with the Taliban recently, and much to Pakistan's shock and amazement, uh, this meeting occurred. And, um, and it did, it appear, according to some of our Pakistani uh, contacts and colleagues and analysts, they said that, um, that they, they were, the Pakistani government was taken aback by this. And it kind of does demonstrate, many analysts argue that the Taliban, it's not the Taliban of the 1990s, that the Taliban have evolved as a group much more, um, I won't use the word westernized, but certainly they've much more, by interacting with the West, have become more uh, attuned to Western interests and concerns. And, um, and this is a view among, shared among some analysts that the Taliban will be more pragmatic in how they approach things. So I guess the meeting with, with India was a good, good sign, puts them on a good foot, but I guess the developments in Northern Afghanistan do not, it, it indicates the military offensives are continuing as they try to encircle Kabul. Uh, yes, that's absolutely right. Uh, the Taliban is incorrectly viewed by India as uh, a proxy of Pakistan. There is a significant amount of friction between the two uh, and plenty of room for India to come in and do uh, sort of uh, expand its influence over there. Uh, however, India has taken a, a sort of a, a monochromatic or, or I should say a very a sort of narrow view of the influence of various groups within Afghanistan. Uh, if it is now talking to the Taliban, it's very late in the game. Uh, it's still going to eventually uh, get some leverage with the Taliban if it pursues this line of uh, sort of action for the simple reason that India is viewed 
uh, extremely well across Afghanistan, uh, whether by the Pashtuns in the south, whether by the Hazaras in the center, uh, whether by the Tajiks and Uzbeks in the north, they have a, a, a sort of a huge influence of Indian soft power amongst these groups. Uh, and given the fact that even the Pashtuns uh, regard India kindly, uh, the Taliban itself is going to have a hard time adopting a stridently anti-Indian stance. They won't do it. Uh, they would also use India as a, as a sort of uh, leverage against Pakistan. So there is an opportunity here, and India has now begun sort of availing of it. So, so your perspective is that Pakistan may have a hard time keeping control over the Taliban after the U.S. leaves and withdraws as more powers compete in Afghanistan in a post-U.S. environment that, that the, the Taliban, who are Pashtun nationalists, uh, will, will seek to apply to, to use all the all the options that they have, uh, that they won't, you, you kind of think they won't end up being a, a tool of Pakistan as, as much as people think. I, I am absolutely of that view. Uh, I, by, if one uh, was observing closely uh, during the, let's say call it Taliban one, uh, between 1996 and 2001, uh, they got into a, a sort of a pretty fractious relationship with the ISI. Uh, the ISI tends to dominate and to control uh, and the Taliban is uh, the very antithesis of, of the, you know, a group that likes being controlled. So uh, there was a lot of friction at that stage. Uh, it was not overt, uh, but when, uh, for example, uh, when 9-11 happened and Pakistan was asked to talk to the Taliban and uh, uh, sort of uh, find a way of uh, handing over uh, sort of uh, Al-Qaeda prisoners to, to the United States, uh, it resulted in a huge uh, uh, sort of uh, bit of friction. The Taliban absolutely refused to comply with, the, with the, what the ISI was saying. Uh, they then openly accused the ISI of being stool pigeons of the Americans. Uh, it's, it's the minute you have a, a strongly nationalist group trying to be controlled by uh, sort of another group or an intelligence agency, you have a recipe for friction over there. Uh, amongst the Taliban, and I've talked uh, on this subject to lots of Taliban in Afghanistan, uh, they see uh, this as Punjabi domination of Pashtuns. Uh, the ISI and Pakistanis, they, they don't call them Pakistanis, they call them Punjabis. Uh, Pakistanis are sort of widely known as Punjabis over there. And uh, the unsaid part to this is those dominating, domineering, pushy Punjabi, Punjabis. So I, I, I don't see uh, me, any way that this friction can be avoided. It will take place as, as time passes. Well, let me ask you, do you think that a quick takeover uh, by the Taliban that results in a, in a reduced role for the commanders, Taliban commanders on the ground, does that forebode better? Does that help the situation better with the Taliban wing that are the diplomats? Uh, does that, if, if it becomes a protracted civil war, one, you could argue that military commanders would be asking for more resources from Pakistan um, to continue the, the campaign and that ISI influence would increase because of that, or if this is a very short campaign and results in some type of, uh, of quick change of, of territory as it seems to be going now, does that, how do you see that? Um, does it, does it, does the ISI in Pakistan lose its influence uh, if, it, if it's a quick takeover? That's, that's essentially my question. Well, uh, the, the first thing that one has to keep in mind is that with the U.S. withdrawal, uh, what will play out in, in Afghanistan is what the ISI wants. Uh, the ISI uh, does not want untrammeled power to be wielded by the Taliban for the reasons that I just mentioned, which is that they tend to be uh, sort of resistant to control. Uh, and they tend to be uh, sort of uh, very stubborn. 
and therefore the ISI will want, and they've, they've openly stated this several times, that Pakistan uh, believes in spheres of influence within Afghanistan. They would they want a, a, a Pashtun sphere of influence or a pa Taliban sphere of influence in southern Afghanistan. They have their own uh, levers to pull Gulbuddin Hakmatyar, the, the, the Haqqani factions and so on. So they will play it as a, as a sort of game where you're minimizing power of each person in turn. Uh, I don't think that uh, there is going to be a, a sort of, a, whether you have a quick takeover or a long drawn out fight with the Taliban, it's going to be ugly. It's not going to be a clean uh, sort of uh, outcome that comes out of all of this. And Pakistan will uh, ensure that it pulls the strings in all of this. Well, I, I completely agree with you. It is a game, whether it's in the Hindu Kush or the Himalayas, it's the great game and it's not going to end. So uh, I, I want to thank you for, for your time today. You've been generous with your time and I very much look forward to talking to get to you again in six months uh, to kind of see yes, where we stand. It's interesting to see how much of our prognosis uh, actually play out. Absolutely. Well, thank you again. And we want to thank you thank on behalf you. of the Foundation and Eastern Approaches. I want to wish you, as I say in Oklahoma, happy trails. So take care. Keep moving, moving, moving. Oh, they're just a moving. Keep them doggies moving wrong.